all Christians go through certain valleys. I hope the message this morning will help you, especially in that area. Would you take your Bibles, please? Turn with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 4. I changed my message. I know what I told you all on Wednesday. Uh, but uh, you know what? My boss changed my mind. You know who my boss is, right? Okay. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to be reading, begin reading at verse 4. We're going to read down to verse 8. And Paul, writing under inspiration to the Philippians, says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything... By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Let's pray. Our Father, help us today. We need your help, Lord. Everything we hope to be, will have, or will become rest with you. Thank you, Father, that it does rest with you. Because, Lord, we know we are weak. So often, Lord, when we think we're strong in a certain area, you bring along something that reminds us we better be leaning on you. Uh, bless this message this morning. Uh, be pleased to use me. Help me to deliver it in just such a way that it makes a difference in the lives of God's people. Uh, fill me with your spirit that I might be the teacher I ought to be, preacher, teacher. And above all else, Father, I pray that you would get the glory. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Now I've entitled this message, Peace with God yourself peace with yourself if you're a believer here this morning you already have peace with God that's the greatest peace that you can never know uh, in Ephesians uh, 2 and verses 14 and 15 we read for he is our peace who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself, in himself twain one new man, so making peace. Now listen. In the book of 1 John, and I think it's chapter 4, there's a verse that says, we love Him because He first loved us. What's that verse all about? Well, it's about Jesus Christ being the one to take the initial step in reconciliation. We were the offenders, not Christ. But Christ wants us to have a relationship with Him. And so He sent Jesus into the world to die in our place on the cross, taking all of our sins upon Himself, and when we believe, have forgiveness of all of our sins and a relationship with Jesus Christ. Christ broke down the wall of enmity between us. But listen, there's another kind of peace that's really important to the believer, and that is peace with self. This other kind of peace that we can experience, that peace 
is peace with self, peace, peace within. In the world, believers have tribulation. Now that's an interesting word because it can mean a lot of things. It doesn't simply mean that which comes about by way of persecution. You look the word up and you'll know what I'm saying. Often there is a battle that goes on within God's children. And that battle, if you will, creates what we call anxiousness. Anxiousness. Worry. I wish I could say I never worried about anything. Don't you? I have to say there have been times when I've worried and God's had to scold me. Why? Because God tells me not to be anxious. Now, watch this. Anxiousness is something most every believer, if not all believers, will deal with in their life. It's something the Bible teaches against experiencing. Now, there are two points to this outline, and they're very simple. First one is this, the, that Christians are commanded to be careful for nothing. Look at Philippians 4 and verse 6. He says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now in the Amplified, and I, I like to use the Amplified, uh, because sometimes I honestly believe the Amplified Bible makes it a little clear in terms of words. So in the Amplified, uh, talking about uh, Philippians 4, 6, do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. But in every circumstance... And in everything, by prayer and petition, define request, with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. You know, I'm a person, I hope you are, I believe that when it comes to prayer, we define our request. You know, it's easy to go through a prayer that says, just bless so-and-so. That's pretty generic when you get down to it. Uh, what is it that so-and-so needs? Do they need God's helping hand where health is concerned? Uh, do they need uh, finances? Do they need a job? We define our request. And that's important, especially when it comes to to being anxious. Now, being anxious about certain circumstances in our life is something we Christians are giving to experience and listen very carefully over and over again. Now, if we're not careful, because it is an over and over again situation, we start liking to live there. Yeah, I remember uh, a number of years ago, uh, Wayne Thompson uh, asking a particular person uh, who was in our home eating with us that day, and that person had shared uh, different things that were happening, and he said, listen carefully, do you like living there? Now, watch this, watch this. some more and some less. It's why this command is placed in Scripture. Now look at the verse, please, because we need to understand that the sentence structure makes it a command. Look at verse 6 again. He doesn't say, uh, if you want to, be careful. Does he? He says, look at this, be careful for nothing. Now, God knows what we need 
in our life. This Bible was written specifically so that believers might grow in their faith, might develop the kind of life that God wants us to have, and consequently, it is often filled with commands. The word anxious, you need to write this down because it's a mouthful and it helps to understand where we're going this morning. The word anxious means full of anxiety, greatly troubled, concerned, worried, disturbed, distressed, or uneasy of mind, caused by apprehension of danger or misfortune. Now I want you to do me a favor, right out to the side of that point you just put down. That apprehension is often about something that never happens. Hmm. What a terrible thing to worry about something this never happens, Joey. You know worry ages you. Did anybody tell you that? It ages you. It's hard on your health. It makes you vulnerable to bad health. I think of all of us who have gone through forms of anxiousness about anything that would say from a human standpoint, preacher, Philippians 4, 6 is hard to receive. You're telling me not to be anxious? Are you kidding? No, God's not kidding. Watch this. But we who know Christ must remind ourselves that as believers to simply look at anything from a human standpoint is not only dangerous but extremely defeating. I don't like to live in defeat, do you? One of the ways to live in defeat is to have the removal of that peace that's within us. The key, as we shall surely point out later, is trust. You know, one of the things about those issues in life that come our way and makes us anxious allows us to know just how much we trust God. One of the great commands found in Scripture is found in Proverbs chapter 3, 5, and 6. Many of you uh, are really familiar with that verse. For some of you, it's your life's verse. Uh, for others of you, it's, it's just one of those verses that you're often given to go into. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Let me read these two verses to you and point out some things that are being taught here. In Proverbs 3, verse 5, Trust in the Lord, watch this, with all thine heart. I wonder why he says with all thine heart. And then he says, and lean not unto thine own understanding. I wonder why he says that. Look at the next verse. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Now, this again is a command. In verse 5, trust means lean not, has the idea, listen carefully, of lying helplessly face down. <clears throat> Look at uh, Psalm 22 and verse 9. Psalm 22 and verse 9. Psalm 22 and verse 9.
But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. And so David saw God. I want you to see this. David saw God's hand in his life even as his mother birthed him. Not leaning as many believers fail to do, that is, not leaning on God, means relying on something or someone else rather than supporting yourself. Now, listen very carefully. I can't help but wonder sometimes if some of the things that come our way that create anxiousness if we're not careful, if they're not purposed by God to teach us how to completely lean on Him. I have to tell you that as I go along in life, sometimes I forget to pray about something. And I step into it to do it. And almost immediately as I step in to do it, things begin to go haywire. And I'm reminded, you know what? You forgot you need me. Folks, listen. One of the things that God wants us to understand as we go through this world is we're helpless without Him. There's nothing that we can do about a lot of things. Oh, we wish we could. Some of us wish if we had the opportunity to turn back time, we wouldn't have done some of the things we did, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't turn back time. And, and even if you turn back time, you might have still did them anyway. Who knows? But the thing that we have to understand, we're helpless. Acknowledging literally means God knows personally and be in fellowship with Him. Direct means make straight, clear obstructions, and enable one to go forward. How does that happen? We trust Him. We don't lean on our own understanding. You know what? There are a lot of things in life that I try to understand I have no clue. Sometimes I, I say to people, I have no idea. I don't know what's going on. My God knows what's going on. Now watch this. As a believer, we need believe. Watch this. That God is able to do what He will. Wise to do what is best. And good according to his promises to do what is best. I wonder sometimes if the reason we are so anxious lies in the fact that we think we know what's best for us instead of acknowledging that he knows what's best for us. Being anxious can even be that which, listen carefully, turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses 25. I want to read a few verses and then I will say what I want to say there. But turn to Matthew chapter 6, please. Matthew chapter 6. In, in Matthew chapter 6, and I just want to read uh, three verses. First one is 29. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Verse 31. 
Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Verse 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now watch this. Being anxious can be over what we need to eat. Or water to drink. It can be over what we want to wear. It's an endless list. The words take no thought. There are three times in Matthew 6. Coming from the Amplified, listen to verse 25 and we'll explain it all. Therefore I tell you, stop being perpetually uneasy, anxious and worried about your life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, or about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life greater in quality than food and the body Far above and more excellent than clothing. Anxiousness can be about so many things. The Amplified verse 31. Therefore do not worry or be anxious. Saying what are we going to have to eat? I was thinking as I read those words. That's what you husbands ask your wife sometimes, isn't it? What are we going to eat? I wonder why you ask that. I think I know. Watch this. Watch this. Or, what are we going to have to drink? Or, what are we going to have to wear? Notice several things Christ points to that are intended to take away anxiousness and worry. Isn't that what we want to have? Come on. Does anybody like living anxious? You like getting up every day worried about? I'm not even going to start the list. How about this? You like going to bed thinking about it? You like driving down the road? Can't get it off my mind. Watch this. First, trust. Notice in Matthew chapter 6, he says something here that is relevant and is a good example and should be an encouragement. Notice he talks about the birds. Look at verse 26. Behold, behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are you not much better than they? Now, why do we feed birds? We afraid they're going to go hungry? Come on! You know what? I have not always fed the birds. Think evil of me if you want. I just didn't think it was all that important. Until I began to discover that there were some really beautiful birds that showed up on my deck if I fed them. So I feed the birds for what reason? To see them. To see them. And I want to tell you something, if you're not careful, it'll get awful expensive. I got in this, in this kick of this idea of buying a whole bunch of different bird feeders. What a dumb idea. Well, they look so pretty on the shelf, and after all, uh, tractor supply had them reduced. Man, i got to get those things. Well, you know what? I ended up using a 20-some pound bag. Didn't quite fill all of them up. And the 20-some pound bag was gone in a week. And I go, are you kidding me? Those things are hungry. Listen. Listen very carefully. God places this in here because He wants to illustrate something. Let's think about a bird. Have you ever known a bird to have a, a cover? Let's see now, you know, it's 
going to come a time and I have to have something to eat, so I'm going to have to stow away the bird seed. Now, birds don't have a barn in which to put anything. And then Jesus makes this statement in verse 27. Look at it, Matthew 6. Which of you, by taking thought, now which of you, by worrying, by becoming anxious, can add one cubit unto his stature, can change anything, is the literal interpretation. Can change anything. Second, worrying, being anxious, changes nothing. It might change your age and your health. Third, consider the wild lilies in the field that are placed there and continue to grow without any help of any kind except the Lord. Verse 28. And take ye thought for raiment, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spend. How many of you have ever been caught walking in a particular place where nobody really particularly lives? There's no house there. And nobody's actually... But all of a sudden, there's this big plot of flowers. And they're beautiful. And it looks like somebody put them there and took care of them. Well, somebody did put them there and take care of them. And it wasn't a man. It was God. And it's the illustration here of just how God provides for us in terms of beauty and what we think we need to wear. And then, if you will, fourth, Solomon. Now look what he says about Solomon in verse 29. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Well, who was Solomon? Well, Solomon in his day was one of the richest men in the world. Uh, Solomon had everything money could buy. But you know what? God says he doesn't compare to the lilies. That's interesting. Now watch this, because I'm, I'm building to something. Notice, you mean much more to God than the birds or the flowers or anything. Verse 26. Read it again. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? The answer to that is yes. Now, that verse means He's going to keep a close eye on you. You know, something I learned, and I don't know if I learned it in the military through some really difficult experiences or not. But one of the things that has been such an encouragement to me every day is that God has His eye on me. He never takes them off. Now, I want to tell you, He has them on Don and Wanda, everybody in here. But He has them on me. And, and, and what, what has He done? He's protecting me. God sees to it that nothing happens without His permission. Now listen, if God permits something, that's a different story. And God does permit some things to happen sometimes. But they have a purpose. They're always within His purpose. Let me tell you something. Never let the devil tell you anything other than this. God is always in control. Now watch this. Second point, you ready? Christians instead are called upon to pray and bring their supplications 
to the Lord with thanksgiving. What's the answer to being not anxious? Praying. Now watch this. First of all, praying and bringing of requests to God should always be followed immediately, look at this, with thanksgiving. You know, some folk have the idea, you know, I'm going to give God thanks when he does it. That's a suggestion that he might not do what he says he's going to do. Did you know that? That's what you're saying. Many of you who heard me pray have heard me say thank you at the end. There's a reason for that. Why? I believe the answer's on the way. Now listen, the answer may not be what I want it to be. But I guarantee you the answer's on the way. Why? Because God promises to answer prayer, doesn't He? He said you have not because you ask not. Now watch this. He doesn't say give thanks only after you've received the request. The giving of thanks at the end of your praying means that you are already trusting God to answer your prayer. Verse 6 says, you are to supplicate with thanksgiving. Supplication comes from the Greek word and is another word for petition or request. Those words in everything, verse 6, simply mean all difficulties that are within God's purposes. One of the things that we Christians need to ask when it comes to a difficulty that we are going through is not why God but what, God, are you doing in my life? What are you trying to teach me? And may I say this to you? Many of you are like me, hard head. Come on. Yeah, my mother says H.H. stands for hard head. That's okay. She said it, and unfortunately my wife heard her, and now she says it. Doesn't matter. Hard head can be good depending on what it is. But listen very carefully. Sometimes we're hard learners. Maybe we don't want to receive it. Watch this. Those words with thanksgiving mean the gratitude that should accompany all true prayer. Beloved, we need to remind ourselves and believe that God will never let us down. Look at Psalm 37 and verse 25. Many of you know this verse, but look at it anyway. Psalm 37 verse 25. I like this verse. How well it fits in this message this morning. Psalm 37 and verse 25. I have been young, David says, and now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Wow. That ought to encourage you, believer. As a Christian, we don't have to beg God. Did you know that? I suppose some have. But look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 through 16. And I can tell you right now, we don't have to beg God. Jesus never, ever taught that. Hebrews chapter 4. And look at verses 15 and 16. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Listen, 
Jesus always wants to be your helper. There's nothing that he will not help you to go through. I don't know where it was. I read some years ago about uh, somebody that said, well, God is uninterested in the minor things of life. No, I beg you pardon. God is interested in everything in our life. Even the things that we might think are the smallest. Now, watch this. Jesus experienced all that we will ever have to come to our minds and hearts. What we have to do is trust what he is already said he will do. Well, what did he say to Paul? I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. I want you to see something here that maybe you've never seen. I'm not sure I ever saw it quite like I did this time. And I've been to this passage many times. But look at verse 7 to start out with. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations... There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure for this thing. I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. You know what I think? I think Paul, when he realized what God was doing, was concerned about what Satan might do in his life. And therefore, his immediate response was what, Lord, you... Please, don't, don't let this happen. Take this away. But God didn't answer his prayer that way, did he? Did he? He said, look at the verse, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for thee. Wow. You know what? Listen, what that teaches, there's no given situation in which God's grace is not sufficient. Now sometimes, listen to me, we know it up here, but not down here. And it continues. The anxiousness continues. Watch this, watch this. Notice what he says. The Christian life should never be about us relying on how strong we are, but trusting in His strength to handle every difficulty that comes our way. Only with God are all things possible. Thus, we have to pray and give over to Him our request. If we're to have, watch this, a peace that passes all understanding that will keep our hearts and minds. Please look with me at uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verses 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Listen very carefully. If you are a believer... As I said earlier, you already have peace with God. But that's not the kind of peace he's talking about here. The kind of peace referred to in verse 7 is a peace with self. Our greatest areas where we suffer a lack of peace, listen carefully, is within us. The peace referred to here in Philippians 4 in verse 7 is God's peace 
that supernatural peace that Christ gives. Look at John 14 and verse 27. John 14 and verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, giveth I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now listen very carefully. The peace that God gives, that supernatural peace, comes to the one who trusts God. Why is it that we don't have any problem trusting God where our salvation is concerned, for instance? I know for sure that to be absent from the body is present with I believe that. So why is it that we can have that kind of trust, but sometimes not that inner trust about things, difficulties? I think Satan loves to heap them up, difficulties. I think he loves to load us down. Why? Because we live defeated lives. We come to certain conclusions that we ought not. We begin to think sometimes that what God said, maybe that's not true. You know, either you believe the Bible or you don't. You know, the best way to believe the Bible is just simply believe what it says. I've been called a Bible thumper a time or two. Anybody in here have been called a Bible thumper? I don't care. You can call me a Bible thumper if you want to. I believe the Bible. And I'm not afraid to speak it. Somebody said you wear it on your sleeve. I do. That lady's in hell today that said that. She left this world unsaved. Isn't that sad? It's not like I didn't try to reach her. But even toward the end, she said, you wear it on your sleeve. Yeah, I wear it on my sleeve. I'm a Christian. Listen. I believe the Bible. It's the kind of peace, this is John 14, 27. It's a kind of peace that takes away our fears. You know, most people who are anxious are fearful. Fears. Something's going to happen. You know, some people are what you call hypochondriacs. You know what that is, right? That's a person that's always sick. Always, something's going to happen. I, 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 I'm going to have something. You know what? The only thing I'm going to have is what God allows me to have, and that's the end of it all. And By the way, He knows what's best. and You know, He always does the best for me, so why, why should I worry? That peace, watch this, is a tranquil state of our soul that transcends all understanding, verse 7. It is that kind of peace that literally guards our hearts and minds from being afraid of some impending danger. Beloved, God knows us better than we know ourselves. Notice we are told to replace those thoughts that destroy peace with thoughts that are healthy and good for our minds and hearts. Look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, let's stop for a moment. True, yeah, because all things aren't true. We ought only to be thinking, have thoughts in our minds, things that are true. Notice the next one. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are lovely. Whatsoever things are of good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Listen very carefully. Look at me a minute. Are the thoughts on your mind that plague you and take away your anxiousness and cause you to fear, can they be defined by any one of these things in verse 8? 
Because if they can't be, listen, you know what he says? Don't be thinking on them. Don't be thinking on them. Now watch this, because I've got to come to a close. Beloved, one of the things that a Christian has to do is bring every thought into captivity. Please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Casting down imaginations. I often say it's, it's good to have an imagination. But that depends on the imagination. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. How do we do that? One way is to spend time in the Word of God. Sometimes you need to spend a little more time. Greater the imagination, the greater the captivity. Notice in verse 4, he says pulling down of strongholds because sometimes there are certain things that are in our mind and in our hearts that are stronghold, that is, they're difficult to be removed. But they have to be removed. You and I, if we're going to have the peace that passeth understanding, close your Bibles, that peace with self, we're going to have to control the thoughts or have the thoughts controlled by God. 